Hey folks, Dr. Mike Israel here for Renaissance Periodization, Hypertrophy Concepts and Tools Lecture Number 30, Training in a Rush. Let's take a look at why we're even talking about this. Ideally, when training for hypertrophy, we'd all always have the time to actually train with a high raw stimulus magnitude and or a high stimulus to fatigue ratio, the best kind of training. However, many people all the time, and some of us, or sorry, some people all the time, all of us sometimes need to do a quick hypertrophy session where time limited, we can't take the time to do the most raw stimulus that we can or even the best stimulus to fatigue ratio. Or just that time constraint. Maybe not all the time, but definitely sometimes. And some people all the time. The next question we can ask is, okay, why not just do regular sessions but only finish them halfway through? Well, here's a really easy example to refute that. Let's say you have 30 minutes to cause quadriceps hypertrophy. Okay, you got to get a quad workout and you only have 30 minutes. Just traveling or something like that and something's better than nothing. Okay. Let's say you say, well, I'm just going to do my regular workout and I'll just stop when I have to go. Like I'll get as far through it as I can and then I'll just stop at 30 minutes. If you are a four to 500 pound squatter, that means you may do one working set of squats and then have to leave because your warm up takes 20 or 25 minutes. You squat the bar, you squat 135, you squat to 25, you squat 315, you squat 405 for one or two, and then you do 415 for sets and reps. Um, that's kind of crazy, right? Let's say it doesn't take you that long to warm up, but you only have 30 minutes. Maybe it takes you 10 or 15 minutes to warm up. That's 10 or 15 minutes gone to a non-stimulative training and only another 20, 25 minutes left in order to actually do what you came to do, which is stimulate hypertrophy. Not great. Now look, if you have the time, if you have two hours, warming up and lifting your heaviest is awesome. It's the best way to grow. But if you can't do that, maybe just cutting a session short isn't the right way to do it. A really quick stupid analogy because we're all as food analogies all the time. If you really know how to make an awesome like chef style French bread sandwich, you, you take a French bread, you cut it perfectly, you layer in mayo on the top, mayo on the bottom, mustard, you make, put a pickle down every couple of centimeters, you got it all worked out, you got to count the pieces of ham you're putting down, all that stuff. Man, that shit tastes good. Great. And when you're at home on a weekend before some Netflix, you oof, you take that 15 minutes, you make the shit out of one of those sandwiches, and oh my God, ecstasy. If your friends are picking you up in two minutes and you got to smash some quick food because you got to go to see a movie with them and you're only eating after the movie, you don't want to sit halfway through the movie starving, you're not going to begin to make your amazing French bread sandwich. And then when you're done wiping only half of the mayo and nothing else has been assembled, your friends are calling you like, hey, we're downstairs, movie starts in 10 minutes. That's not a good strategy. You have to completely revamp your approach and say, okay, I'm making a sandwich, right? Same thing as I'm hypertrophy training, but I have this huge time constraint. I'm going to have to go about making a sandwich differently fundamentally because I want a completed product at the end. Just the same way, when you're rushed for time, you're going to have to apply certain strategies differently that you normally wouldn't apply. Like that sandwich, you might just take out a thing like a spoonful of mayo on white bread, squeeze those slices together, open it up, throw some ham in there, cheese. You don't even have time to reach into the pickle jar. Close, throw into your mouth, friends come pick you up, you have a great time. Success. But is that a good sandwich? No. I mean, it's fine. It does the job of making sure you're not hungry. Is it going to be the sandwich that's amazing and awesome? No, it's not, but you don't have time for one of those. If you try to make the best sandwich, cutting off halfway through is a way worse than half a sandwich because at least you got some ham in there and you got the mayo on both sides. If you just have half a French bread with half the mayo on it and not even any meat, your friends call, what are you going to do? Eat the bread with the mayo? People are like, hey, what kind of sandwich is that? You're like, I don't know, it's not really a sandwich at all. <laughs> what the hell are you doing, right? So you could say, okay, okay, if we're using these abbreviated hypertrophy strategies, special strategies, why don't we just use them all the time, even if we, if we have time? That's the same thing as being like, why don't we make dog shit ham sandwiches hastily assembled with whatever mayo and they're, they taste like crap. You have all of the night to watch Netflix and eat sandwiches and you make a crappy sandwich, you eat it, you're like, Bleh, and then you watch Netflix. That would suck. 
right? So similarly, question could be phrased technically for hypertrophy, why not use the highest STR, stimulus to time ratio strategies, which is really what this lecture is about. Why not use them all the time? Because most of the high stimulus to time ratio strategies do not have the best raw stimulus magnitudes, and they almost certainly don't have the best stimulus to fatigue ratios, which means you're literally getting sub-quality training when you don't have to be if you ever use these time crunch strategies when you're not time crunched or use a lot of them at the same time. So for example, if you never have time to stiff leg a deadlift heavy, because you're always using these strategies, you'll never benefit from heavy stiff legged deadlifts. There will be a categorical type of muscle building you just never get. And you could look at someone's hamstrings years later and be like, man, your hands are huge. How'd you get that? They're like, stiff legged else, man. I've been doing, you know, up to about 365 for eight reps nowadays. And you're like, man, uh. And they're like, well, do you do them? I'm like, no, I just do supersets of like, you know, 45 degree back raises to hamstring curls. I'm done with my hamstring workout in 10 minutes, but how come my hands are that big? And they could tell you truthfully, there's nothing you can do in 10 minutes that will maximize your hamstring growth. But if you only have 10 minutes, that's just halfway for a warm up for stiff legged deadlifts and you'll get zero hamstring growth. So basically, you use these strategies when you want a five on a one to 10 hypertrophy scale for the workout. And when just starting a normal workout that would give you a 10 and getting halfway through it would actually give you a one or a two. That's when these strategies work. So. What do you do if you or a client or anyone you're helping has a very time constrained situation? You use one of nine approaches to higher stimulus to time ratio training. Here it is. Number one, use mostly compounds. Obvious, because isolations take usually a very similar amount of time, you know, three sets of biceps and rest, right? But if you do three sets of pull downs, not only do you get some bicep growth and lat growth, or sorry, not only do you get some bicep growth, you get lat growth as well. Whereas if you did bicep curls and then straight arm pull downs, you get sort of both, but it takes doubly as long, right? So compounds for sure. Secondly, you use more general compounds than specific compounds, okay? So technically speaking, a JM press or a close grip bench is a compound exercise, but it hits mostly your triceps and not really much of your chest. So if you want both triceps and chest in one workout, you're gonna have to do something else. But if you do a medium grip bench press, then all of a sudden you get both triceps and chest with one exercise. Or the other example, if you do wide grip bench, you have to do something else for triceps. But if you do close to medium grip bench, you get a good measure of both, so you can conserve time that way. So not only are we doing compounds, we're doing compounds that hit a bunch of different muscles relatively evenly. Here's a, a trippy thing. If you, for example, and this is again, something you normally wouldn't do. If you're training quads and glutes and you literally have 10 minutes to do them, you're not gonna do close stance squats and leg presses. You're gonna do wide stance sumo squats because they're gonna hit your glutes really well and your quads pretty well. It's an even balance. But if you only did leg presses, for example, and just started with leg presses and say, I'll do my glutes later. By the time you get to glutes, you have to leave the gym, right? So the level of specificity is actually gonna be lower. You're gonna be doing more general training because you usually have to cover multiple muscle groups, right? Next, number three, you're gonna use exercises that require less warm up time than others. For example, lunges versus hip thrusts. Warming up for lunges usually isn't that hard. You do a couple lunges body weight, wait around, stretch a little bit, do a couple lunges with the weight you're gonna use, wait a little bit, and then do work set, work set, work set, work set. Sweet, it's like five minutes, maybe. What about hip thrusts? Well, you gotta get a barbell. Sometimes you have to wait for a barbell, sometimes you don't. Then you gotta get a bench, you gotta put it up, unless your gym has a hip thrust machine, which is very rare. You get, and here's the thing is, lunges you can do anywhere, especially with dumbbells. Hip thrust machine might be taken, so there's another problem. Let's say you don't have one. You got to set up a bench. Then you got to set up a bar. Then you got to put 45s on that bar. And a lot of people, when they learn to hip thrust properly, they can actually hip thrust a lot. And that means you have to warm up because you don't just go right to 585 or something like that. So let's say you're hip thrusting with 405, which many people can do. 135, 225, 315, so on and so forth. Holy, holy crap. 15 minutes later, you are with, you know, doing your last set of three at 315. It's not even your first work set at four or five. You've run out of time. Or to compare it more realistically, someone who did the lunges instead, they're already in 80 reps of lunges and they're done training their glutes, right? Another one is something like push-ups, weighted push-ups versus barbell bench. And as much as it pains to admit this, machines come in really handy here. A selectorized leg press machine where you just click and there it goes, 
even if it's not the best SFR machine for you, because the plate loaded one could be better, it's just so much faster. You don't have to load the plates and you can be in and, and boom, 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 get what you need and get out, right? A uh, chest press machine versus a, a barbell bench, especially versus dumbbells, because you got to put them down, pick them back up, so on and so forth, right? So sometimes warm up times and transition times from set to set, rep to rep, et cetera, you want to minimize those. Again, notice. The, our raw stimulus magnitude is not that great for a lot of these things. The stimulus to fatigue ratio may be not that great for a lot of these things, but it has to be something that's traded off for how much total stimulus you get from being able to squish it in. All right, the raw stimulus magnitude for rep for rep or set for set isn't as good, but you get so many more reps and sets in with these faster strategies. The total stimulus through the session is actually higher than if you try to do your best, took too much time. Next one, lighter loading ranges. One of the reasons for this, probably the biggest one, is the fact that with lighter loading ranges, you don't have to warm up as much, right? If you're doing uh, walking lunges with just 30 pound dumbbells, it takes like three minutes to warm up for that. But if you're gonna be squatting uh, or, uh, or, you know, hundreds of pounds, it takes a long time to warm up for that. Even if, let's say, exercise for exercise, you're going to be lunging with the 80s. You don't just jump to the 80s. That's at least one or two more warm-up sets for if you just do the 30s, right? A bench press, you do 135 for super high reps, that's a couple warm-ups. But if you do 275 for lower reps, that's more warm-ups and it just takes more time, right? And you absolutely, and here's a huge, huge point, you do not want to rush your warm-up ever. That is exactly how you get hurt. So if you have heavy weight to lift and you're in a rush, untenable situation, mutually exclusive. You got heavy weight to lift in five to 10 rep range, you will not be in a rush. You're gonna cancel or postpone your plans and take your sweet fucking time. But if you can't cancel or postpone the plans, you gotta get the hypertrophy work in, sets of 10 to 20 and a lot of times 20 to 30. Much better because they don't take as much time and if you rush the warm up a little bit with those, you're probably not getting hurt. You rush the warm up even a little bit with heavy weights, you could be in trouble. Number five, huge one, antagonist supersets. Instead of doing three sets of bench, waiting between each set and after, and doing three sets of pull downs, what you can do is bench, pull down, bench, pull down, bench, pull down, bench with like 30 seconds between each one of them. A lot of high quality work in a very short time. Now, is it the highest per set, per rep, raw stimulus magnitude? No way. Best stimulus to fatigue ratio? Not even close but as how much actual total work and total stimulus you can smash in a very short time, awesome. So give that a shot, right? If you're really in a rush, it becomes difficult to explain to yourself, right? Uh, imagine aliens came down and watched you in the gym and you said you only had a session to hit your whole lower body in uh, 30 minutes and they watched you do a set of squats and then rest for three minutes. Now, what do you think they'd ask? They have no idea about lifting or anything. They're just really smart. They'd be like, he said he was rushing. They're like, yes. Why is he waiting for three minutes? You're like, um, well because he's stupid. That's what it is, right? So instead of doing squats and waiting for three minutes, you may be able to do some squats, wait a minute or so, do some leg curls, which don't tax your whole system a ton. After you've done leg curls, wait a minute or two and do squats again. That way you get basically double the work, not as high quality of work, but double the work in the same amount of time and you really are using the time as well as possible. So if you say you're in a rush, but then you spend a lot of time waiting, you're like, well, I got to take my three minutes rest. Bullshit, right? Antagonist supersets, great, great way to do it, especially with compound movements. Time-saving training methods, myo reps, right? You get bicep, let's say you've got time to do cable bicep curls. You've already trained all your other muscles, great, but like, oof, I, I gotta get out of here, the gym closes in five minutes. What are you gonna do, straight sets and wait three minutes between? You get one and a half sets done. But if you do myo reps, you do in five minutes, nuclear annihilation to your biceps. Holy shit, five minutes. You'll be leaving the gym in four minutes, but like, get me the fuck out of here. Thank God that you know I don't have to wait another, thank God the gym's not open longer. I'm like getting ready to leave. You're doing your last myo rep set and you're like, please kick me out, right? So now are myo reps always the best answer? No, they're not, absolutely. And there's some trade-offs and downsides there, especially if you use them super consistently. But every now and again, they're a great way to just limit rest times and still get a great uh, workout. Supersets. Right, as opposed to doing skull crushers and then later doing curl grip bench as their own exercise, which has raw stimulus magnitude advantages. Right, you do a skull crusher superset to a close grip bench, and you smash a lot of stimulus into a much shorter time. Drop sets, great for this perspective. Right, instead of doing three by you know three by ten leg press, do you know ten leg presses close to failure or whatever on your first set. Have some friends peel off some plates, do another set of ten ish, peel off another plate, another set of ten to twenty or something. You'll fall off that leg press, and it'll be awesome. It'll be three minutes of work for a roughly you know maybe eighty percent of the stimulus that you would get from what would otherwise take ten minutes. Right now, 
Notice, if you aren't time constrained, why the hell would you do something that's only 80% stimulative to what it could be? You wouldn't, so don't. But if you're really that time constrained, it's a really good idea to try something like that. Next, cycle your volumes less or not at all, especially if you're consistently constrained on time. So for example, if someone can only train for 45 minutes at a time, are they going to be doing four sets per session beginning of the mesocycle and 16 sets per session at the end? No, where the hell are you gonna stuff 16 sets? So what they actually would probably do is start more like at eight sets per session at the beginning of their meso and go up to only 12 sets per session at the end. Both of them are within that 45 minute window. Sessions take a little bit shorter at the beginning, a little bit longer at the end, or if very time constrained, they just start at 10 and end at 10, or start at six and end at six, and then they use other loading variation and reps and reserve variation in order to potentiate gains as opposed to altering volumes. Like in an ideal world, is traveling from lower volumes to higher volumes better? Of course, right? But sometimes you don't have time for that. You, what you definitely don't wanna do is be super constrained consistently, like I only have 45 minutes a day to work out, and then like half your mesocycle you spend sitting around in your training, be like, man, I only have four sets today, I guess I'm done at 20 minutes. And then the other half of your mesocycle be like, oh shit, I gotta go, I gotta get all these sets in, and they're all dog shit, high, uh, lower quality sets. Bring up your sets earlier in the meso, break down your sets later, and use other ways of doing it. And people could say, well, you know, volume, Progression is better. Why don't we do it? Because you just don't have time to do it. The fundamental problem isn't the fact that we're not doing volume progression. That's the adjustment we made. The fundamental problem is we don't have enough time. That's it, right? Number eight, use lower reps in reserve. Again, you are trying to cause as much disruption, as much hypertrophy in a very short amount of time as you can. Why the hell would you leave tons of reps in the tank, right? Getting from three RIR to zero RIR takes, well, like three to six seconds. And it magnifies your hypertrophy significantly. So why would you not do it? You could say, well, it causes a lot of fatigue. Okay, but you have so little time to train, your MRV is almost never gonna be hit, right? If you train four times a week for 45 minutes, and you're probably like, you can do all the volume you want that you can squeeze into 45 minutes and basically train everything almost to failure or to failure and not worry about excessive cumulative fatigue. Now, you would worry about that if you were able to train due diligence, hour and a half, per day, six days a week. Yeah, you can get into serious trouble, start at three RIR. But if you train very, very short, or if it's an exceptional day, let's say you're traveling and you've got to get a workout and you are you get out of the airport and go to a gym and you got to be back in three hours. So basically, you have one hour to work out. Are you going to be doing leaving reps in the tank? Probably not. Every set is probably going to be close to failure or right at failure. That you could zap the shit out of yourself, do some my reps, drop sets, compound alternating supersets, and you come back on the airplane and you're just like this for the next flight. Great. You did a really good job with the time you had. That's the ticket. Lastly, again, if you are in that problem with number seven where you're consistently short on time, you want to use distinct specialization phases more often. Here's what I mean by that. Some people have the luxury of being able to grow their chest and back roughly evenly at the same time because they have the time in the week to train their back between MEV and MRV and their chest between MEV and MRV, right? And so long as they're not over a systemic fatigue threshold, they can grow both really, really well. You, on the other hand, may only be able to train whatever, 45 minutes, four days a week. You can either have really good back training or really good chest training, or if you do both, training that is under maintenance volume or like under minimum effective volume for both. That's stupid. That's backwards, right? So if that's the case, what you probably want to do is take your back and put it on MEV to MRV, really good training, and for several months, maybe a block, keep your chest at maintenance volume. Then switch the other way around. Back on the back burner, maintenance volume, chest minimum effective volume to maximum recoverable. One grows, one stays, one grows, one stays, and so on and so forth. And someone could say, well, why don't you grow both at the same time? Because if you try, both get a crappy workout and both might be at their MEVs or under and get really, really bad gains, right? Give that some thought. So if you're training in rush or you have lots of clients that train in rush, which is very likely, Give these ideas some thought. There's nine, you don't have to use them all, but feel free to sort of a la carte style, use all the ones you need to take the amount of work that you're putting into a small session and magnify. It's not gonna raise its raw stimulus magnitude per set and per rep, sorry. It's probably gonna lower it. It's probably not great stimulus to fatigue ratio, but when you're very time constrained, you have to do your best for that given situation. Folks, thank you so much. We'll see you next time.